We've talked a lot about how we might defend our satellite so far. Let's now shift our attention to adding a communication channel with the ground. If the satellite is taking images of the Earth, we want to be able to reliably send that information to the ground stations. In between the satellite and the ground is the ionosphere, which is an ionized region of the Earth's atmosphere. When I say it's ionized, I mean there are lots of free electrons and also ions, charged ions, in that region of the atmosphere. As you can see here, the ionosphere has many layers to it, and the number of layers and the characteristics of those layers depends on the time of day as well as solar conditions. Now, in order for the satellite to send data wirelessly to the ground, it needs to be able to send an electromagnetic wave through these layers of the ionosphere, and the signal needs to be strong enough at the ground for a receiver to pick it up above the noise level, both above the receiver noise level and also above the electromagnetic noise background level, which if there are other sources of electromagnetic waves in that frequency range in that area. Let's say that our satellite will be 200 kilometers above the ground. It's going to be in low Earth orbit so it can take images of the ground, LEO, LEO, low Earth orbit. Also, the new communication channel we want to add to the satellite will operate at a center frequency, FC, of 1.6 gigahertz. This frequency is in what's called the L band. They name parts of the spectrum for convenience. It's a frequency that is commonly used for Earth observation by LEO, by the LEO, by the low Earth orbits satellites, because higher frequency bands are reserved for sending data at higher speeds, like for communications, where speed is more important, since higher frequencies allow for higher data rates. Also, an L band signal is not affected as much by rainfall and cloud water content compared to higher frequency signals. First, Let's figure out how we can calculate the amount of power flowing in an electromagnetic wave, and then we'll think about what impact the ionosphere might have on our signal. So first, the amount of power in an electromagnetic wave. Just as electric and magnetic fields carry power down a transmission line, we would expect there to be power flow in the direction of propagation for an electromagnetic wave, here between the satellite and the ground station. How might we calculate this power flow? Well, for plane waves, which we've been talking about so far, by the right-hand rule, E crossed with H gives us the direction of propagation. You can see that here in this diagram. So then we might also expect that E crossed with H would also tell us something about power flow in the direction of propagation. And indeed, to give you a preview, this E cross H is equal to what's called the pointing vector s. They use s in Ulibi, so I'll use s here, although in a lot of books you'll see a capital P is used for pointing vector. This pointing vector equals the instantaneous power transferred by electromagnetic fields at a point in space and time. So instantaneous power flow. So a, a, a moment in space and time, so for example, um, here I'll just say here for s, s in general could be a function of x, y, z, and t. But what is physically being transferred by the propagating electromagnetic wave? To understand what is being carried by the electromagnetic wave, we can look at what's called Poynting's theorem, and this was named after English physicist John H. Poynting. What this says is, notice here we have the Poynting vector, and if we look at the power flow through the surface, it's a closed surface, so let's just imagine we have like a sphere, and we're looking at power that's flowing into this sphere, so this might be S vector, then, here we're integrating all the power flowing into that imaginary sphere. Now let's see what that is equal to. 
that is equal to this first term is the rate of increase of, of the total magnetic field energy. So rate of increase of the total magnetic field energy. And so then the second term is the rate of increase of the total electric field energy. And this is inside the volume. So inside the volume of the sphere, the first term here is the rate of increase of the total magnetic field energy. And this is the rate of increase of the total electric uh, field energy, plus any power that's dissipated in the volume due to ohmic heating. So if you look in the notes for this lecture, it shows how you can derive this equation. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all those details, but if you have any questions about how this equation is derived, um, I am happy to answer them. So this is how we can think of power flow for our electromagnetic wave. In our design challenge, since we have a specific frequency, 1.6 gigahertz, or a narrow band of frequencies right around 1.6 gigahertz, it is useful to have an expression for S that holds for the sinusoidal steady state, specifically an expression for the time average power density. In the interest of time, I'm not going to show the derivation of this equation either. Uh, the derivation is written out in detail in the notes for this lecture. But basically, if we take the instantaneous pointing vector, S, and average it over one period of the wave, and I'll say in time, then we get the S time average pointing vector is one half the real part of E phasor, vector phasor, because we're in a sinusoidal steady state now, crossed with H vector phasor complex conjugate. This is the final result for the time averaged power flow in a sinusoidally varying electromagnetic field or wave. You can compare this with your circuits class result for the time averaged power dissipated by a circuit impedance in a sinusoidal steady state. And for that, we had S time average is one half the real part of V I complex conjugate, or you could write it as real part V RMS I complex conjugate RMS. Now, you can go ahead and always use this expression for an electromagnetic wave to determine the power flow, but and it'll give you both the direction, because it's a vector, direction of power flow and the amplitude. But if you remember from earlier in this class, whenever we can assume that there's a plane wave propagating, rather than having more complex electromagnetic wave propagation and interaction, we can greatly simplify the geometry for a problem and, and also many of the equations that we need to solve a problem. So first, let's see if we can assume that we have plane wave propagation for the satellite communication with the ground. The center frequency of our propagating signal towards the ground is 1.6 gigahertz. And in free space, the wavelength at 1.6 gigahertz is 19 centimeters. That's calculated using C equals F lambda. And in a material like the ionosphere, the wavelength is going to be even shorter. That is because the 
speed, the phase velocity of our wave is lambda f, which is also equal to 1 over square root of mu epsilon. And the frequency of the wave uh, is not going to be changing um, unless we have certain materials. Uh, but for now, we're just going to assume the frequency is not changing, so instead the wavelength is going to get shorter. So as a result of all this, the electromagnetic wave traveling over the 200 kilometers from the satellite towards the ground will quickly, uh, within a couple wavelengths or so, of the satellite, look, it'll look like a plane wave.